Join us on our website at www.thegrandview.org and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting. No, don't say anyway. I love it. It's perfect. <laughs> because I kind of was looking for an abstract painting. Remember, the thing that I didn't want is a painting of origami cranes. I specifically said I want to look at the painting and not know that. Because I knew if you got enough shapes in there, enough forms and shadows and all that, it should look crazy. It should be abstract. I'm not an artist that loves abstract. Look, I'm telling you to do abstract. You, do, you nail this one like perfect. It's the abstract. Not only that, look at how cool it hits all the sides. Yeah. I mean, it becomes something totally different. This is not a painting of origami birds anymore. It is a, a great design, abstract form. When we dig into it, we go, oh, there's some clues. We've got a head here. We've got another head here. There's some really cool things. The shadows are just a tid too dark in some places. But you making those darker, you're really taking it to an abstract form. I think it's crazily good. <laughs> good job. I really love the fact that you did what I just said about the homework assignment. You brought it out of the surface. And it becomes really interesting that way, rather than having your object in the middle. When you're focusing your object as if it were a thing on stage like that and put a light on, it's a little bit too operatic. You want a little bit of chaos and things rolling off to the side. You want your things touching the side and get it. I mean, when you go and do something in Photoshop, most of you who have played around with Photoshop, you've cropped, you are the cropping tool. And you're surprised when you start cropping how much you could get rid of. That's what you need to do with your paintings, is start to learn how to crop that down. Sargent used to paint a watercolor, mainly on watercolors, he did some oils, but watercolors, he, no, he did this to some oils. He painted lots of oils, but mainly with his watercolors, he would paint them on a very large sheet of paper. And Richard Schmidt does this too. He paints on a much bigger surface. And he paints whatever it is, and he just lets it go. And then he goes to his framer, and he'll take two of those sheets of paper that have the corners, like mats, and they'll play with it till something hits. And then that way, when you're working on a surface and you're worried about where the golden mean is and all this stuff, you have all of that to play with. So you can adjust that. And so a lot of museums have gone to the point where if they're looking at a, a sergeant watercolor, they make the mat plastic so you can see through it. So they'll show you where he decided where the composition is, and then they'll show you all the stuff that he cut out of it. And sometimes some of the stuff they cut out of it was really good stuff, but it countered what he wanted to do with that particular painting. So cropping is a really important thing. And so, you know, I, I'm not opposed to having an, a student do homework assignment and then take a couple of pieces of masking tape and mask part of it off and show me just a masked area and said, this is the area I choose. And then we would just critique that. So if you find that you, you know, aren't quite in the golden mean or whatever, then mask it off. Um, Richard Schmidt does the same thing. He does a much larger painting and then he'll find where the painting is. And just something off a little bit can change the golden mean on that. Just a little bit can change the golden mean on that. And you know that when you're putting down a couch. When you put down a couch and you're looking at it, or your husband puts it down, you guys don't do it because women are better at this than guys are. But when the guy, or your husband puts a couch down, you'll sit there and you'll look at it and go, mm. there, perfect. It's one inch, but that one inch is the golden mean at play. So what were you thinking? Who's is this? Marilyn. What were you thinking? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
You uh, Vermeer's? Floors, you know, the oh, the floors on Vermeer? <laughs> so you remember what my homework assignment was? <laughs> Do you need somebody to call you during the week and remind you? I need assistance. My homework assignment was do only white origami cranes. No, I, I, no, I appreciate it, but I don't want to have the rest of the class go, well, Marilyn never does what you say, so why should I? I'd have total mutiny. Yeah, these actually look more like dragons than they do cranes. Um, well, you know, the thing is, is that the composition does hit the sides. It's very, very interesting. Um, I'm not sure if this takes me away from the cranes themselves as a central focal point. The thing that, the thing, I, I absolutely love it because the first thing is, is that it is an abstract. It, it, there is some form to it, but it's abstract. If this were hanging in the gallery, it's definitely something that would pull the viewer in. You've got a beautiful cent, uh, center focal point. It is, it is kind of really concentrating on the things themselves, although we can't really tell what the things were but it's not really a highlight shadow painting. You do have beautiful lighting effect in here. And so I, I would probably say, you know, as far as the light hits and this, it's, it's, it's successful. More realistic than I would like to have seen, but in itself an interesting piece nonetheless. But these tend to, in our heads, we say, so what are those? You know, we're really kind of like trying to figure out what the things are instead of having more interested in what the effects are. So the effects would have been the cast shadows of these. And so if you would have set this up and brought the light lower and had cast shadows, and then we would have had light and shadow, then you'd be a rock star. Problems. Painting is one of these things that you do that if nobody's looking, you can get away with a lot. I know a lot of you do that. But what happens after a while is if you go, oh, well, that's not quite right, but it doesn't really matter so. And then you kind of go, oh, well, that's kind of, and there's these little tiny things. Before you know it, the painting starts to drift off. I know sometimes when I'm doing like, even like animals, I'll go, well, you know, the fur's a little thicker here. You know, so I'll do a fox and, and yeah. oh, it's got to be a little thicker here. Or, you know, your brush strokes go over the line a little bit and you go, Oh, I'll deal with that in later, you know. And before you know it, you end up with a big kitten. <laughs> I've got a big kitten in my studio right now. Started off as a fox, but now it's like big woolly cartoon. So as an artist, do we follow our muse and, and go, well, okay, well, you know, or do we like say to ourselves, no, I'm going to pull it back and redraw it and get it right. You should draw it and get it right. It doesn't matter with this, but you know with portraits and everything else, you kind of have to get it right. And it means a lot in a portrait situation, but not so much on this. And I'm doing a painting right now of, of otters. And I, one of the rules with painting is you should never leave the painting with something that you know is wrong on it. And I had uh, kind of fudged some reads in it and it was wrong and I thought oh, it's late don't feel like fixing it I'll fix it next week when I start painting again and then that little thing came in my head if you're a professional artist you never leave the painting knowing that something is wrong and you go back and fix it so I said okay that's the thing that brings us back um, so I went ahead and fixed it it took me another 45 minutes to get it back I would have probably been better to go to bed but that would have been against the gods one of the things that I've learned too is that, you know, you have five seconds to change your mind. If you want to get something done, and some of you procrastinate. So some of you think, oh, I'm going to do my homework. At that moment, you need to step. You have five, four, three, two, one. Chances are you'll talk yourself out of that homework in five seconds. If you get a hint that you want to do your homework, do it at that moment. If your alarm clock uh, get, starts off in the morning, your alarm clock goes off, don't hit the snooze button. Go five, four, and before you get to one, jump up out of bed. So you have five seconds to do anything. This is what procrastinators do. They have this five second clock that, you know, and they go five, four, no, I gotta make dinner, no, I gotta, 
and all goes away. So one rule is if you got that inkling that you want to do the homework assignment, the moment you think about it, step towards your studio. Pick up a brush. Move your stuff around to start squeezing paint out. Five seconds you have. Otherwise you find, you find yourself in the realm with the rest of the world saying they're gonna, but they never do.